Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, Movie Thoughts. I could yammer on forever about Gollum, including in this film, in spite of the very brief duration of his screen time. And don't worry, I, I did know that it wasn't going to be very long, so I didn't leave the theater crying bitter tears that my favorite character was not heavily featured. So rather than go on and on about everything I love in the scenes, I will just say that I basically love everything about the yeah, the entire depiction and limited to saying that I feel like they make him enough of a primal being in this so that you would basically know where what it is without having seen the other movies without having watched the Lord of the Rings movies and at the same time get the sympathetic side of him that that works really well you know when he kills the troll and then you know the the blue light of the elven sword goes out maybe Maybe it was because the troll died, maybe it was because the elven sword got embarrassed that it real it, it's only realized that's a troll, not an orc. I'm only supposed to glow blue when a you know orc orcs around. It's a moon sword, you know. And uh, yes, that's that's one thing. Another is the the delicious childlike expressions on Gollum's face as he solves the riddles, especially that one, I think the one where the answer was eggs, where he just keeps looking like, I've got it, no, that can't be it, I've got it, and it's just constantly, I, I love that, and I think the theater, yeah, the theater did as well, they were just laughing and just enjoying it so much, and I feel like it's the kind of scene, anyone who's watched the first 10 minutes of Lord of the Rings, of, of The Fellowship, of the ring knows exactly what is going to transpire in this scene. We know how it's going to end, but it still works. It's a compelling scene, and we still understand why Bilbo doesn't kill him. And it, you know, harkens back to the, the Gandalf's line about it's, it encourages knowing when not to use your sword. I guess he had just watched Valhalla, and. Yeah, it, it really works. You know, you, you understand why he sympathizes with the, the the poor creature and, you know, getting away, you know, whilst being invisible and the whole thing. It just, it worked really well. And then we have this great scene where, you know, Thorin again talks about how he doesn't think that Bilbo should be there. I really love their two characters and the way they both change over the course of the film. Like I said in the review, these two characters could easily have come across as obnoxious, and it really comes down to the talent on display. The impeccable casting, the great acting of both. I really, I wish I knew the name of the actor behind Thorin because I'm deeply impressed and Peter Jackson's direction, it really, it works, and it could so easily have failed, because these are characters that on the surface, you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to hate about them, but you kind of have to go beyond that. You, we understand why Thorin is kind of distant and proud, he can't really let anyone in. He, there's so little of his people left, and they're so, they're scattered. They don't have, you know, it's it's the that thing of the in, in psychology you have the, the pyramid of the, the of the 
needs, I think it's something like that. I, I studied it in Danish, I don't know what it's called in English. Where if you don't really have like a home, you can't satisfy the other things and he, they don't have a home and and he felt betrayed. He, it, loyalty is important to him, and he thought that he could trust in Lithrandu? Lith Lith Something like that. Legolas' father. And then he was abandoned. And it just... Yeah, you understand why he doesn't want to let anyone in. And then he meets Bilbo, who is this... Clearly, he doesn't... He hasn't been on adventure before, and when you just look at Bilbo, you don't think that he could possibly fit in on an adventure, and basically what it comes down to with Thorin is this kid is, this guy is gonna, excuse me, get himself killed. I don't want to be responsible for that. I don't want this guy to die for this cause which he isn't which isn't even his own he's not a dwarf it's there, there is that pride there is this kind of well if you're not going to help us when we need it we're not going to accept your help when you offer it and and that's not you know specifically directed to hobbits but it's just kind of he, he's isolating himself and his kin and you can understand that it's it's a logical reaction to it. And then with Bilbo, we have this gradual, you know, and also he starts out, like I said in the review, he's this awkward, kind of gentlemanly, he's, he's very polite. I love when he is talking to the two dwarves, you know, when, when it's only two dwarves going over all the food in the poor guy's house, the poor hobbit's house. And he's like, look, I, I, it's not that I don't like company, because I do, but, yeah, I don't know why I'm making him way more Irish than he is, which he isn't at all, I think. I, I just, I want to know the company before they show up at my doorstep, that's all, and I, that's just how I feel, I'm sorry. And they just, they've been talking all along and making noise, and they just stop and just look at him, you're forgiven, and then they return to, it's just, it's priceless. Anyway, it... He is this fish out of water on, out on adventure, and I mean, he leaves for the adventure, and literally he starts out saying, no, I, I, I shouldn't write. I'm, I'm in good shape. I'm sure I can keep up with you. Dude, no. I don't even, I've never ridden a horse. I've never really been in any kind of situation around people riding horses. Even I know. You don't keep up with horses on foot. That's, it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And now I'm turning all southern all of a sudden. And right after, stop, we have to go back. I forgot my handkerchief. And that's just, that's the most pathetic thing he could even be missing at that point, and they rip part of the edge, yeah, you can use this. And that's what it, it instantly becomes clear that he's not, he's gonna have trouble out here without the comforts of his fairly large for Hobbit home. And yeah, it really, he, he changes, he matures over the course of it, and it's, it has the, it, it makes me think of soldiers who've been drafted, who didn't sign up, they didn't volunteer, they were drafted because it was necessary, we had to bring in all the young, capable men, and they, you know, that then when you're just in that situation and you might miss stuff from home, but you just have to, you know, if, if you do, if you act now, if you act when it really matters, you can save lives. And that's when it's, it's really impressive when one of those 
actually does step in and say, you know what, I, I don't want to be here, but I am here, and I can save lives, so I'm going to do it. And he really does. I, I find that the, the entire growth of that, with, with these several... The Thorin voicing his, you know, his, his frustration with Bilbo. Sometimes even, you know, pretty much to his face. You know, I, I, even he sees Bilbo almost leaving in the night. Bilbo obviously having forgotten about that whole guard thing. Yeah, I, he's not necessarily the sharpest. And, you know, he says, I have to go home. And then the other says, you know, well, and, and it kind of comes to, well, oh, you don't have a home. And he kind of realizes, and later, you know, when, when, Thorin says, oh, that hobbit ran the first chance he got. He's on his way back to Rivendell right now. And then he pops out from behind the tree, having slipped the ring off. You can kind of tell Gandalf pretty much has guessed that, that he probably already knew that Gollum was in there. And he, I, I feel like he knows basically what's just happened, but it's not really to be dealt with right now. Right now it's about the dwarves. But, but yeah, he, you know, he slips out and he answers what Thorin said and he says, you know what, I, I can't even imagine what it's not, not to have a home, so I want to give you guys your home back, because I wouldn't want to not have a home. And yeah, that, that really works, you know, and, and Thorin evidently hasn't learned from, you know, when he said it to... Bilbo's face, you know, he was even, he was lying there awake, excuse me, when, you know, seeing Bilbo try to get away, and still he badmouths him. Sure, he, at that time, he doesn't think that Bilbo can hear it, but still. Why do people always do that in fiction? They always talk about someone like they're not there when they can hear them. It's like, you know, I, I don't know, if I was in fiction, and aware that I was in fiction. It was, if I was Deadpool, I would just make sure that I you know, looked around. Okay, the person's not around, now I can badmouth them. And the and, and then jumping ahead to the end, he actually jumps you know, away from the tree, gets the blade out, and actually saves Thorin's life. Yeah, Thorin, I can appreciate that you want to hark back to the flashback battle, but at this point I think you should probably use an actual shield instead of just, what was it, oak wood. I don't think that's going to keep working. I, I guess that he just didn't have a shield on him there, but, or maybe he just wanted to taunt Az Azog, I think that was, how was these names. But yeah, it, you know, Bilbo gets out, saves Thorin's life, and I get, I'm pretty sure that it actually benefits him that it's just a letter opener, as the, the, the other guy says, you know, it hasn't been used in a war, it's not even a sword. I'm pretty sure it says letter opener. Because it's so short that he can very quickly draw it and, you know, stab Azog with it. And if it was a longer sword, Azog, being this quick, big, Orc, he would very quickly, you know, just jump on him, and that would be it. But because it's so short, he can just get it up, and yeah. No erection jokes, please. And and I really don't want to know how well equipped hobbits are. Anyway, the yeah. So so he saves him, and and then you have that moment after they've been flown away, you know, after the giant eagles come around to play toss the warg and, you know, carrying away all of these, you know, all the dwarves. I like how they actually made sure to pick up every single one. We really see every single one get picked up. You know, and, and it was like Gandalf falls down and then lands on top of one of them. And one of them, like, grabs Bilbo and then lets him go and then he lands on the back of one of the Eagles, and that's again we have the the animism. He he, Gandalf talks with a little butterfly, and it causes a butterfly effect. It 
picks, it, it gathers all these giant eagles and, you know, they want to help. Probably because Gandalf promised that the sooner they would show up and help, the less of a forest fire he would start. Only you can prevent forest fires by, you know, breaking Ian McKellen's stick or something. Just, yeah. I, I guess that's, that, that little bit of a destruction of nature is okay with nature, yeah. And the, the other bit of animism, of course, of the giant living mountains who start out by, I guess, tossing chunks of themselves, considering it's also a mountain that they toss at each other, and then, of course, Presumably they realize, hey, that was actually my foot, maybe I should stop tossing parts of myself. They start playing Rock'em Sock'em Robots instead. Anyway, I wanted to talk about the Thorin and Bilbo speech. When Thorin says, you, you almost got yourself killed! Didn't I say that he didn't belong out here? Didn't I say that he would... He should just have stayed at home and stayed at the Shire and... All this stuff. And I was just sitting there. I, I knew that he was going to say it, but I was wrong. And then he said, I've never been more wrong. And I was just, I, I couldn't help but smile. It was just, it was such a great character moment. And the big hug. And it's just, it's earned. Because you felt, you understood why Thorin had a problem with Bilbo. He really didn't want him to die because of not being ready for this. And Bilbo wanted... He's, he's, you know, he, he doesn't really feel like, how do you say, it's, maybe I'll be able to return to it, basically he, he has to choose between the to the toque, toque in him and the baggin in him. Is he this curious adventure type of the toque, or is he just quiet, calm, just stay where I am kind of type, and at the end of the day, he does have this adventuring spirit in him, and even though he might rationalize and, you know, look for comfort and the, the like, he does really want to be in these bigger situations. It, it feeds something in him. We, we do all have a drive, a desire for adventure, for experience. And that's also, you know, Gandalf talks to him with it, and it's like, when you were a kid, you really wanted adventure. Now you've grown up and you haven't had adventure, so you pushed those dreams aside. You still have those dreams. And, you know, deep down, if you really stop and think, and that's, that's true of a lot of us, we, we give up ideas that we had as children we, we feel like, oh, that's too so juvenile, that just doesn't... And, and Gandalf is very much a guide to where he, he gets you in the situation where you realize... He's, it's, it's the teacher man of fish kind of thing. He gets you in a situation where you can be what you have the potential to be. He doesn't hold your hand and guide you through it. He gets you in the right situation. And he knew that Bilbo would be the adventuring type. That's why he left the contract. I, I'm willing to bet that was him leaving the contract right there for Bilbo to read. And now, when it's now or never, when he doesn't just get to sit there in his nice chair in the evening and think for a while, which he did the evening before, you know, it's like, you've sat there for a long time, you still haven't given us an answer. When, when he gets up in the morning and he finds the contract, now or never, then he just jumps and he takes the decision. And that's, that's a very true lesson. Sometimes we overthink things. And I'm not, I'm not holier than that. I overthink things crazy. And sometimes the most, the best things can come out of just making a quick decision. Sometimes we're just like, well, that was fun. I mean, if I had really stopped and thought, I wouldn't have done that. But it was fun. I'm glad I did it. And sometimes you need that. Sometimes we do overthink. We're, we're yeah, we're, we're too thinky and too, too analytical sometimes these days in, you know, in this postmodern world. Postmodern, modern world? Anyway. And 
yeah, it, it really comments well on that. And I also want to talk about the the omen of Bilbo grasping his destiny. Again, no erection jokes, I swear. When we, we see him growing closer to, to the, the pony he was riding with uh, the, the Myrtle, with him hiding an apple and going over to you know, just our little secret, feeding the apple to the horse. Because that happens. You get attached to the, your steed. And there, there gets to be a bond between steed and horseman, horse hobbit. That's common, I believe, in fact, between just you, you depend on each other, and yeah, and when he is supposed to be, you know, bringing food to, I think it's Philly and Keely, he at, at first, he just you know, he's told two of the horses are missing, and he tries to guess. You know, the, you're the burglar. Well, what's doing? And well, it was something big that uprooted these trees. And then they find the cave troll, spot the cave troll without the cave troll seeing them. And then he's, but that's that's Myrtle. I, I don't remember the other one's name, but that's like that's I want my horse back. I love that horse, and he actually agrees to go and risk his life to save them. And I, I feel like that's the first time you really get this, yeah, this thing of just seeing him really be willing to, excuse me, to be courageous, to, to, to accept his drafting. He, he will try to save lives because the horses were going to be eaten, you know. And the... Just briefly, before I forget, because I, I'm, I'm thinking horse eating, that already, right there, tells you these, these trolls are bad, they're evil. Who would eat a horse? You know, no disrespect to that culture that eats horse meat. I'm, I'm making a point. My point is, when they get down to the cave trolls, and the one of the first things that happens, you know, they're, they're talking about, oh, he's gonna, you know, they're, they're clearly evil, but how, how do we know they're evil? They grab the deaf one, they, they grab that hearing aid thing he has, and step on it. Now you know they're evil. That, that just, yeah, that was a little, funny to me, and, and Stephen Fry's role was priceless. That was just so good. And and his death as well, with the, it'll take more than that to kill me, and he's like, that'll do it. And, and then they fall the way down, oh, it couldn't possibly get any worse. They get crushed by the Stephen Fry's, yeah, that was, that was funny. Anyway, the, the three trolls, I could personally have done without the snot thing, you know, on, on Bilbo, but it, it was okay. It's, and, and I can see a lot of, especially children, laughing at it, of course. But it was just, it was great how you could totally follow. It's, it's this very simple setup. He's hiding out, and I love how they use that as well. How he also hides from the cave trolls, and that's when he gets to Gollum. And I've talked enough about that scene, I promise. And, yeah, he, he, and it's again this thing of even the seemingly most insignificant can, you, you can turn that into a strength. He does it with Azog as well, the, the shorter shoulder, the quicker to raise, and yeah. Anyway, he, yeah, he, he sneaks over and, and tries to get the, the knot up, but oh, it's big, it's like, you know, those hands were like, four times the size of his hands that tied those knots, they're just going to have to take forever for him to undo. And meanwhile, they could turn around any time. One of them has a sword. So he goes over and he tries to grab it. Oh, crap, he gets up. And the troll scratches his ass. That was pretty funny. And he sits back down. And, the, and eventually he grabs Bilbo, thinking that he got the, the, the handkerchief. 
and yeah, it was it was great. It was. I think I would have disliked the the snot thing down downright disliked it if it had been like well that came out of nowhere. But it was set up. He was sitting there sneezing, yeah, you know, and and he also sneezes down right in the pot and it's like oh that's flavor. Well, I got more. It's, wow. And then he grabs it and blows his nose and puts it back. And it's set up. You know. You know, and when when he grabs him and blows his nose, that's like the third time he's blown his nose, or there's been some snot thing with him. So it it doesn't come out of nowhere at all. And it's like, look what came out of my nose! I don't like the way it's moving. I lost it. Oh God, that was funny. Anyway, yes, the the entire scene was very funny with the the trolls arguing over how to you know the 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 dwarves rush in all of them eventually and fighting and then they all get captured and he some of them are going slow roasted on the on the spit and the 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 other kind of spit you know and Bilbo realizes about Gandalf up there, and, and he realizes, oh, the, the sunlight, and he, and, and also because they talk about, you know, we don't have all night, we have to get away from the sun, and then, oh, and then he talks about, you know, you're doing it all wrong, this is how, the, the secret to eating good dwarf, and he's like, the, the secret is, um, hmm, you have to flay them first, that's the first thing he comes up with, of course, and they're like, I am going to murder you afterwards, you are, you are dead, Bilbo, and then, then one of the trolls like, ah, I've eaten them with, complete with skin and boots, and it's, you know, you're completely wrong about that, and yeah, all this talking about, well, should we do it like this or do it like that, and and then the the thing about, oh, you, you shouldn't eat him because he has parasites or something like that, and then that great moment. It, it could so easily have been a bad joke, but where one of them, you know, one of them says, like, oh, we don't have parasites, and then, or I don't have parasites, and then another of the troll the dwarves realize what, what Bilbo is doing, and he like, <laughs> and then the, the, the dwarf is like, oh, right, parasites, we all have parasites, I have, to, I have to have the biggest parasites of the entire group, I, you'd go so sick if you ate me, and the whole thing, and you know, Gandalf manages to break apart one of the rocks and, yeah, they turn to stone. Really beautifully done as well, the effect. But, but yeah, you know, Bilbo really saved them. If it hadn't been for him, the dwarves didn't think of it. And, yeah, he, he saved all their lives and eventually including the, the horses and the ponies. Was it on the ponies? Anyway, yeah, it was just... It was great. There, there was room for him, you know. And I also like how Gandalf, also as the, the guiding presence, doesn't tell, uh, you know, Thorin and the others that he's taking them to elves, that he's taking them to Rivendell, because he knows that that's how to proceed. And Thorin is too proud for his own good. He is too convinced that he shouldn't get help. And he gets help with the, the moon room thing. And I love the bit about the food with the, you know, when he, you know, when he speaks Elven to them. I, I love how they keep saying Mithrandir at first. I, it was like, it kept being said to Gandalf and he kept like turning around. I kept expecting him to say, that's not my name and you know it. But evidently it's like a greeting, but it's both like, it's not only hello. So I guess it's like yo, because at one point, the glorious looking Galadriel is, why did they have to put her in that dress that, that really just goes all the way up against the skin? I'm gonna try to stop thinking so much about that. When, when she is trying to get Gandalf's attention, when he's walking away from it, she also says it, so I guess it's just their version of yo. Now, 
Yes, the, the speaking elven to the the, the dwarves who are all like standing uh, ready for, and and the horses are riding around them, and he he you know, Agent Smith does an entire sentence in Elvish and he is still alive and the, the one of the dwarves is like does he offer us insult? And Gandalf is like no wor don't worry. He's offering you food. And then they all like huddle up like the, the football players. And going, oh, oh, oh. Turn around. Well, lead the way. <laughs> that was great. That was really funny. And then cut. And it's it's like salads and all like vegetables. And they're all like sitting and looking at We should try it. I, I don't I don't like pizza. Where's the meat? And and like Got it on the fork. What is this? What's, do, don't they have any chips? That was so funny. Now, the... I love Radagast. I just... I don't want to take away a single second of his screen time. I'm, I hope he's in more of the of the Hobbit movies. I really loved his character. It's just it's so sweet the way he just loves these animals and wants to care for them. And he really seems like he's he's about to just die from grief every time he finds an animal that is not well. And he's just, you know, it, it, when you first see him, he's got this white stuff all the way down the side of his face. And the, the first thing I'm thinking is, is that is that bird crab? Is that what that is? And then he lifts his hat and two birds sit up there and he puts his hat down. And it's like, yeah, it's bird crab. He, he uses his, the top of his head to transport small birds sometimes and they crap on his head and he doesn't bother to, to rinse it off. That's, that's his character. He, he's, just, he's so at peace with nature. And it's, it's at the same time funny and endearing. It's, it's, and, and yeah, the, the whole thing with trying to do, save the, the little porcupine, it's, just, it's so sweet, and, and his lighter voice, and, and the thing with this, this sled, with, you know, pulled by rabbits, rabbits from Denehor, you know, I'd like to see them try to outrun me. And he even, some of them come from like an angle and basically in front of him and they still can't catch up to him. That's awesome. And he actually, he really helps by being so in touch with nature. It's, it's great. And the, and, and the sword presented to, to Gandalf. And I love the dichotomy between Radagast and Saruman. And Saruman, I'm not sure if he's in the book, but he didn't really need to be here, basically, but it does, you know, it's seeing him before the Lord of the Rings, and you get a hint, you know, he's, he's talking about how, ah, Radagast, he's crazy, you know, and we find out that, you know, we know from Lord of the Rings, not a spoiler, that he used to be more fond of the forest, Saruman did, and in this, he's talking about, you know, Radagast, he's all in touch with the forest, he's crazy. He eats too many oh, mushrooms. <laughs> that was funny. The dude is just not big on recreational use of natural, you know, I was going to say natural highs. I guess that is what many drugs are, come to think of it. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, the pipe of Gandalf and now uh, the mushrooms, yeah. And I love when Galadriel telepathically communicates with Gandalf, and Saruman is like, you would think I was talking to myself. He's, he's clearly not even paying attention. That was really funny. He, he realizes that, that Gandalf isn't listening to him anymore. And Galadriel's smile when she realizes, you knew they were gonna run. And, he's, and Gandalf's like, yes. <laughs> that was Perfect. That was so good. And it's just like, well, go ahead, Saruman. You know, gather up some. You know, a troop. there there are orcs out there. There, are, you know, animals are having trouble. Surely you're not gonna want to travel by yourself. And the dwarves already have a head start. There's no reason for him to 
you know, pack up and try to pursue them, he's not going to be able to catch up to them. He, he'd need to pack and all this stuff and uh, gather, you know, other people to travel with him. And yeah, so it really doesn't, he can't stop the, their mission now. Now the let me think. I I did think that with when when Thorin was being carried by the the eagles and they were like, oh, is he gonna make it? As dude, eagles' claws are infamous for providing CPR. Don't even worry about it. I also noted that uh, briefly after Gandalf brings him back to life. So wait, who's the necromancer in the movie again? <laughs> I really liked Azog. I think that's his name. With you know his his Mister Claw kind of Bond villain thing on, you know, have him chop an arm off, and he gets this steel thing. I I really did hope that he would like unscrew it and screw other ones in, maybe in the sequels. And I like how he just uses it to grab the throat of that one. You know, two guys show up. It's so it's prototypical villain stuff. Two guys show up, one of them says, we didn't manage to kill the target you sent me out after. The guy who speaks gets grabbed and you know killed, made an example of. Then the boss rides out with the other henchman, of course. It's yeah, I don't know if that was all in the original Hobbit novel, but if so, then that, I guess, is where all these other writers have gotten it from since then. Because that is just seen so many. And he gets to be war of food. Yeah, you probably should have gotten killed fighting the dwarves instead. It probably would not have been quite as painful. And Azog is just seriously badass. And the... I, I enjoyed him as a villain. I like how you can kind of tell that he's going to be the villain. I mean, when, when you see the arm chopped off and Thorne says, oh, he couldn't possibly come back, you kind of get the idea, yeah, he's probably going to come back. And then you actually see him, you know, you, you see the orcs, you, you see the sword blowing glue. Yes, that's what I said and that's what I'm sticking with. Have you heard of blowing glue? It's, you know... It's a little kinky, but I, I don't want to get involved with that. Anyway, sword glows blue, and and now I, I of course can't say it wrong. Darn it. And th we know that there are orcs around, and the orcs... And this is right after we get the flashback, also, because, you know, the Feely and Keely make a joke about, you know, night raids by orcs, and then we see the orcs, and they're like, ah, that was the one we were hunting, so you know, ah, it's Azog still, and they ride back, and, yeah, they, they eventually report to him, and then you see him ride out, so you know he's gonna be, it's, it's, that's gonna be the climax, that they're gonna have to fight him, and, yeah, it was, it was very enjoyable, and I liked that there was this dual kind of revenge thing going on. Both Thorin and Azog wants revenge over the other. You know, Azog wants to, for one thing, also finish the job. He wants to, you know, what was it, break the line of Durin. And, you know, both the father and the grandfather are apparently dead and gone. You know, he even decapitated the guy and, yeah. So you can kind of understand why Thorin is maybe not on his Christmas card list. And Azov also wants revenge for the arm that he sorely misses. And Thorin, you know, wants revenge for the father and I think also grandfather. It was a little unclear. I don't know. I, not sure it was really mentioned that he was for sure dead. He kind of disappeared. So maybe he's going to show back up in one of the other movies. Anyway, there... Yeah, I, I just like that we have this... It's very potentially destructive course of action 
of revenge, and it's pursued by a hero and a villain, and it nearly costs the life of the hero. Excuse me, while the villain, excuse me, loses a lot of forces to this quest. And you, you really see, it's, it's again the pacifism. It's, you, you shouldn't seek out strife. You shouldn't want to kill someone else. It, you know, violence begets violence. If, if Azog had let it go, think of all the, well, orcs, yeah. A lot of orcs would still be alive. And, yeah, I, I thought that worked quite well. And then we, of course, have the, what's it called, the, the troll cave. I, I like the, everything about that, really. I, I, I've already talked a little about Stephen Fry. I love the escape from the troll cave, where they're, like, knocking over trolls, and some come from behind, so they, they grab a ladder and use it as a bridge between two platforms, and then they throw down the ladder so the trolls can't keep coming from behind, but then they're coming from the side and from the front, and they just keep having to fight all these. It was just great, really fast-paced sequence, and that's one of the things where I feel like there's so much going on. You can't pick it all up in just one viewing. So when you, you know, when re-watching, just watch another part of the screen, you're gonna get a completely different, you know, you're gonna see things you didn't, you, you missed completely the first time. And again, without it being excessive, I would make, <clears throat> yeah, I, I suppose I could draw them into Star Wars Episode 3 for battle scenes that have way too much going on in them, to the point where you just, it's overstimulating and you, you can't keep track of it all, and you just stop. It's, it's just too much. And it's just, you know, it's not really a secret that Peter Jackson is a better director than George Lucas is these days. I, yeah, George Lucas used to be good. I suppose that might more or less cover it. I will close it out the way the movie did. I love that they, at the end, finally get to... I mentioned in the review that I feel like the plot could be summed up in like 10 seconds or less. I suppose I can try to, let, let's see, we have the Dwarven homestead gets destroyed by a dragon because there's a lot of gold. The, the 13 dwarves gather to reclaim that homestead are joined by Bilbo Baggins and they eventually get to a place where they can see the well, they, they get helped by the elf, elvens, elven people, excuse me, to find, you know, to determine exactly how to get in once they get there, and then they get to a place where they can see it all from the horizon. And that's it. I guess that was more than 10 seconds. But if you condense that, if you cut out all my uh, awkward pauses, and cut out the stuff where I didn't really say anything, I think it would... I, I think you get my point, at least, and if, if, I, if you feel like I really missed something that genuinely was critical to the plot, be sure to let me know. I, I really don't mean to sell the movie short. I enjoyed it quite a bit, but yeah, it's not plot heavy. It's, it's about the world and the characters more than the plot, I would say. It's, it's very full. It's... It is like a novel. It's like reading all these little tangents and descriptions of worlds and characters where it's not really moving the story along, but it's informing. We, we get more, more, a more clear idea of the world that takes place and the people we're following. Anyway, yes, I will 
as I said, close it out as the movie does. They get to the mountaintop, can see Erebor, I think, off in the distance, off in the horizon, and we zoom in on it. And, and at this point, we, we the audience, basically know what it is that's going to happen. Oh, and the, we see the birds flying in, and you know, they're saying, ah, oh, it's the, what was it, not ravens, or something. And Gandalf says, no, that's a different kind of bird. Um, I don't know birds. Excuse me. And they, they still say, oh, it's still a good sign. And I guess with the end, we don't know for sure if it is a good sign. Maybe it is the right time to take back Erebor from Smaug. But it still doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And the bird flies in and it finds a little snail complete with its 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 home. And having watched chickens, having observed them and fed them, I can attest to the <laughs> birds wanting to eat the insides of a of a snail, but not really being able to get through the you know having to deal with the yeah the the house the home I don't know what you call it in American yeah first. And it, it keeps banging it against the hard surface, and we go into Erebor, into the, where the, the gold is slowly, and we hear the, the sound of it, you know, echoing all the way down. It's completely quiet. And we see all the gold, and it's glorious. And then suddenly, a little gold is brushed aside, right, by the hot air. And we see a little bit of smog peering out. And we see where the eye is, and, and I'm just sitting there thinking, it's going to end on the eye. It's going to be a real lizard eye. And it swims in, and the eye opens and does the lizard thing of, you know, where the, the pupil starts out like wider, and then goes thin, and then fade to black, end credits. I'm watching the next one. I want to see what happens. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.